Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Authors on the Air, part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. I'm your host, James Latwell. And with us today, we have Bruce, Bruce Borges and Bruce's new book, Shades of Mercy. Uh, I think you really get a blast out of it. It's, you know, this is the second book in this critically acclaimed series. The Bitter Past came out last year. And I mean, it just blew up, Bruce. You did, uh, it just, uh, it's just really hit and people gravitated to it. So uh, congrats on that. Oh, thanks so much, man. It's and it was a nice surprise, you know. When you're you're really getting your fr- your first traditionally published book out there, you really don't know what to expect. So I was right. happy that it 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 seemed to uh, be accepted uh, by by so many so well. Yeah, it it was, and and usually sometimes you see kind of like a sophomore slump in that series, and. Uh, Shades of Mercy does not let up. I mean, you you kind of kept the kept the pedal down on this. Could you tell people a little bit uh, what they'll be looking at and what Porter Beck uh, will be facing in uh, Shades of Mercy? Yeah, so the series really is set in uh, the Nevada desert in eastern Nevada, so it's kind of high desert, um, and it's in a very rural county, which is a real county. Um, it only has about 6,000 people, but it's the size of the state of Maryland. And Porter Beck is the sheriff there. He's a guy who's in his 40s. He uh, has recently retired from the Army um, and spent a lot of time in intelligence work. Comes home to take the job that his father had for 30-plus years. Um, and He's got a few uh, interesting facts about his life that come into play during the stories. Uh, one is that he basically has almost perfect recall for anything he's ever heard in his life. So he has an auditory memory, much like a photographic memory. Um, so he literally remembers every single thing that's ever been said to him or where he's been in a room with somebody. Um but he also has uh, a kind of a, a, cha- a physical challenge in that he has started to develop or started to actually have symptoms for an eye disease that uh, doesn't allow him to see very well, if at all, in the dark. And so he, he really can, I call him a daylight man because he only sees well during the daylight. So that's kind of where the story is set and who Porter Beck is. Um, And then uh, the first book uh, is really a dual timeline story where he is trying to solve the murder of a retired FBI agent while at the same time trying to figure out how that murder ties into the hunt for a Soviet spy 60 years earlier in, in the desert out where that all of that secret secret stuff takes place uh, about 75 miles north of where I live here. Um, and then the second book picks up from there. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's a completely different story, but with the same set of characters really. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to read. And, you know, Porter Beck is such a interesting character. I mean, he, he's a cop kind of following in his, his father's footsteps and he's got this rural area, you know, he can't rely on some of the the easy things that a big city cop would do, you know, backups not right around the corner. Uh, his military background figures into to who he is. How did you settle on Porter as, as the character for this series? I think what did it for me, Jim, was, you know, I, I spent a lot of time up in Lincoln County doing my research. And just kind of getting a visual sense of the place, because I knew that's where I wanted to set it. Um, and then I I went in and I met the actual sheriff of Lincoln County. And I started interviewing him. And very quickly, it became apparent to me that there are some unique challenges to being a law enforcement person in a place like that. And he had he shared with me the, the greatest stories. And I, I mentioned some of them almost literally in the book um, where, like you just said, backup is not around the corner. Um, it, it is oftentimes an hour or more away. And I asked him about that. I said, well, you know, what, so what do you, what do you do for backup? And he said, well, 
your backup is the the other guns that you carry in your vehicle. You know, I mean, and he was very straight faced about it. He wasn't joking at all. He goes, "That's that's very typically how it is here." So it kind of solidified in my head after talking to him how to make a character like that. And it was, uh, it was perfect, really. I didn't have to come up with a lot. I, I leaned a lot on the things that he had told me, the things he had shared with me. So the only thing I really wanted to do with Porter a little differently was kind of give him a, uh, a sharp sense of humor. Uh, you know, he's very quick witted. He's very smart. Um, not that the sheriff that I was talking to wasn't, he's a very sharp guy, but a little bit different in that area, not a typical, uh, rural cop, uh, attitude or mentality that you might see. No, he comes across as a, as a really, as, as a fun character. You really want to know and get invested in his, in his journey in this, in this series. And, and, and as I was reading, you know, Shades of Mercy, you know, this is, this is a book that folks won't have to necessarily have read the bitter past to get, get enjoyment out of. So you've, you've captured that, you know, a complete story in the book, but as I'm reading this, I can't help but feel that people who read and enjoy Craig Johnson and Longmire will love this one. I mean, it, it's that same kind of feel that, that lawman that's kind of up against, you know, a lot of odds and, you know, he's got this, you know, this moral compass that keeps him headed in the right direction. But I got that sense that, you know, Craig Johnson kind of an influence here in this character. What do you think? Well, definitely. I mean, he, he had been an influence on me for many years. Uh, and when I started writing the bitter past, I, I wanted to write a contemporary Western um, much like he does or much like CJ box does. Um, that has contemporary people in it, um, interesting uh, things taking place in those specific kinds of areas that a lot of people, even who might live out West, don't see a lot of or hear a lot about. So, and, and, and again, the first book, The Bitter Past, is drawn on real events. Um, the second book, Shades of Mercy, is very much uh, uh, reflective of a lot of things that are happening, especially on the technology and science side of things. But Craig Johnson, I loved the Longmire series. I'd read all the books. Um, he actually was gracious enough to blurb the Blitter Past for me. So I have his quote yeah. right on the, the front of the book jacket. Um, so he's been a huge influence and, and there's a, you know, there's several people like that for me that, um, you know, you read and you, you try to model to some degree and you try to emulate. So he's definitely at the top of my list. Yeah. But no, you've, you've captured that essence in, in your own way. It, it's not a, yeah, it's not a cop, a carbon copy of, of Longmire, but, uh, that kind of feeling, you know, was present for me in the book. And I think, like, like I said, folks that like Lamar will, will eat this one up too. So. Yeah, I hope so. That was certainly my intent. <laughs> <laughs> Good deal. Now you've got a couple of other, you know, really interesting characters in, in the book and, and mm -hmm. Mercy Vaughn um, is one of those. She's, she's very unique in her own, in her own world. Um, and she's not to let too many secrets out of the book, but you know, she's kind of a hacker, you know, and she, He's pretty, pretty good at her job. Um, how did you come up with her story and, and her, uh, really her, her talents? You know, sometimes I don't have a real good sense of how to articulate how I came up with ideas for some of these things. They, you know, I just start putting um, some thoughts down on paper at the beginning about, okay, well, I want to write about technology. And in this case, it involved uh, quite a few things, military drones that, that kind of start off the book and, and some of the technology and developments we've made there. Um, and then I had been doing a lot of reading about how some of those unmanned aerial vehicles have been hacked and taken over in, in mid-flight, uh, you know, typically by our adversaries. 
And uh, I thought, well, okay, so the, here's a real opportunity to introduce something interesting about hacking. And I just kind of came up with this idea of almost like Elizabeth Salander character and girl with the dragon tattoo, um, a little bit different, uh, about the same age. She's 16 years old. And when Porter Beck finds her, she happens to be incarcerated at the local youth center, which is where the state sends all of the, the delinquent, you know, juvenile delinquents that they can't figure out what to do with. And, right. and the folks at the youth center don't really know Mercy's true story. Um, what's in her file is not why she's really there um, and who she really is. So, um, part of the fun of the book is, is figuring that out and it takes a while. Yeah. And, and I, I love the way that character kind of unfolds through the, through the book because she's, she's got kind of a rich storyline that, um, yeah, I, I think folks won't see coming and it's, it's really well done. So kudos Thanks. on that. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, now you, you mentioned it, you know, you're talking about drones and hacking and, and how much research did you have to, to jump into to kind of get the technical aspects of that down? Because, I mean, the way you presented it in, in the book was was really, really well done. Well, I, I hope that's true. I, I did spend a lot of time. It takes me typically about three to four months to get through all of the research uh, on my books. This one was no different. Uh, so I did a lot of reading first off on the technology that was going to be at play to begin with. So a lot of the stuff about, um, and I, I mentioned some other things in the book about in the hacking world. So not only, not only UAVs, but uh, things called zero days and zero days are vulnerabilities in software that the creator of the software uh, doesn't yet know about. Um, and when they're found by some person, sometimes it's a hacker um, who's in it for money or some other nefarious reasons, uh, they find a backdoor or some problem, a bug with a software that they can exploit. That's what's called a zero day. And the clock starts at zero um, to the time that that exploit actually gets, or that vulnerability actually gets fixed. So I did a lot of research on those things. It, and I read a lot of books um, and try to learn as much as I could. And then I, I found a guy through a friend of mine uh, who lives in Southern California, who works in the, the cyberspace area and uh, worked for a firm that tried to do everything it could to thwart those kinds of intrusions into the software that the companies owned. So it took a long time, but I vetted everything that I ended up writing through that person also to make sure that what I was talking about was authentic and it was communicated in a way that wasn't overly technical and that most readers could get because reading some of the stuff, researching it uh, was, I, I had to ask a lot of questions because it was completely over my head. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could have easily gotten into the weeds with the technical aspects of it, but I think the way it's yeah. presented in the book, it, it doesn't detract from the story, the overall story that you're telling. So I, I think it was handled very, very, very well in that, in that set instance. Good. That's good to hear. <laughs> There's another character in, in the book that um, that starts to have a relationship with with Porter, and that's uh, Charlie Blue Horse. And one of the things I thought was interesting was the origin of that character's name. <laughs> Do you want to share that with folks? Yeah. So she is a detective that works for the uh, Department of Public State or Department of Pu Public Safety for the state. Um, longtime detective. She's also a Paiute uh, who comes from the Walker Indian Reservation up near Reno. Um, and uh, so they kind of meet and uh, because of the situation that's developing in Lincoln County and it brings in the state police and uh, Charlie and Beck just kind of have an instant connection. 
Um, neither one of them are married. Beck is, as I said, uh, you know, in his, uh, at this time, he's about 48 in Shades of Mercy. And Charlie Blue Horse is a little bit younger than that. Um, but they've, they've got a natural connection. And I wanted to have somebody that I could uh, bring in some different uh, background on. I, I always love stories that involve Native Americans. And again, that, that in, entails its own amount of research to make sure that you, you stay authentic and you get everything right. Yeah, and, and I think you you did that very well in, in, in the story. At the Native American aspects didn't appear to be a bolt on. I mean they were they were part yeah. of the story and they made they made perfect sense. But yeah, I thought that was good. And the, the origin of the character's name. So it's interesting. So when I was sniffing around, I don't know how you look for characters' names for your books, but you know, I going back to when I first started writing, I used to just open up the phone book, right? And of course, now we have everything online and you can do things much faster. So I, I did some research on the, uh, the, the reservation up there that I was talking about uh, near Walker River. And um, I stumbled on to a person who sat on their board who had the name, the last name Blue Horse. So I just came up with that name. I thought, well, that's authentic. <laughs> it's a real name. So, um, real name. and then, and then freakishly, my wife and I ended up getting a, a golden retriever puppy last uh, at the end of last year. And we didn't know what to name it. And I said, let's, let's name it Charlie blue horse. <laughs> so oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. We're going to put you in, into Porter Beck's head here for something we call three quick hits. And Good. it's three quick questions about, Porter and, and, and his, and what's in his mind. So what's Porter's favorite cocktail or drink? Uh, he's a wine guy. He's a red wine guy. Um, it's not something he brags or boasts openly about in rural Lincoln County where everybody's drinking beer or whiskey for the most part. But uh, yeah, he, he loves a good Cabernet. Got it. How about his favorite music? What does Porter listen to? Well, he's he's got very eclectic taste because again, he has um, uh, an auditory memory where he, as a matter of fact, in in uh, Shades of Mercy, or actually is might be in my yeah, I think it's in Shades of Mercy. He he recalls hearing a um, a song uh, when he was like seven years old for the first time in 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 his father's barn. And so he, he listens to music from every era, doesn't have, uh, he probably has a lot of favorites, but um, he just listens to everything. And, he, and, and unfortunately for him, he remembers all the lyrics to every song. So when people are singing next to him and they get the lyrics wrong, he's always correcting them. <laughs> I love that. And then finally, what is, uh, what's Porter's greatest fear? His greatest fear is losing his eyesight because he has this progressive disease. It's called retinitis pigmentosa. It, it is working in his case very gradually as it often does with people. He actually didn't have symptoms until much later in life than most people who have the disease do. Um, but it can take 20 years or more to play out to the point that you can't see during the day either. Um, but he's he, he's really afraid that he's going to be a burden to people later on. Um, I mean, he's not so concerned. He's not acutely concerned as much as he probably should be with not being able to see at night now, because as you can imagine, for a law enforcement officer, not being able to see half the day could be a problem. But he's he he goes to sleep at night and he thinks about and he has nightmares about waking up blind and what that's going to mean for his life. So it's, again, something that he doesn't talk a lot about, but it's certainly in his inner dialogue. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Folks, we've been talking with Bruce, Bruce Borges and the author of Shades of Mercy. Do yourselves a favor. Check this one out. Uh, I think it's going to get some uh, a lot of attention this year. It's only been out a couple of weeks. So, um, folks, you're going to want to, you're going to want to find this one. Bruce is a, is a good guy and a great author. So do yourselves a favor. Thanks so much for having me, Jim. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's been a lot of fun and uh, thank you for coming on.
Yep. I'll see you in Nashville. You bet. See you there.